throughout my career at the European Space Agency, I passed many significant events in ESA's history. Milestones, first attempts, landmarks. Looking back, they may appear like isolated events, similar to a collection of single dots on a piece of paper. I want to share the knowledge that I gained along with my journey while connecting these dots. My name is Paolo Ferri. Welcome to my masterclass. Eureka was uh, an incredibly innovative spacecraft from the point of view of the design and also the aspects of the design which are important to operations, like the avionics. It was a spacecraft built in the 80s, but with a conceptual design that was 20 years ahead. Um, the problem with Eureka was that it was not properly and not thoroughly tested for various reasons. So when we, when we got it in flight, um, we, we had a lot of surprises of uh, hardware failing, uh, units not behaving as expected, uh, behavior not fo fully documented. So this was an incredible challenge on the whole team and this put an enormous pressure on every team member. On top of that, uh, there was um, the cooperation with NASA because um, uh, Eureka was brought in space by a space shuttle and then recovered 11 months later. So this meant cooperating with uh, 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 human space flight, which was totally new to the center and extremely demanding for all the health and safety issues related to it. Um, so if you combine all these elements, uh, certainly underestimated effort for the cooperation with NASA and uh, the world of the human space flight with a very fragile uh, spacecraft that failed uh, almost continuously, um, this put the, the team under this incredible pressure on the short term to react to failures and on the long term because of the workload. On the other side, uh, this was an incredible adventure. Um, the, working with the NASA human space flight, working with a spacecraft that you really had to keep alive with your teeth and your hands and uh, with all your body, it was like uh, navigating on a boat in the middle of the ocean that was falling apart, but you had to actually get to the other side of the pond. And this was, uh, for me especially as a young engineer, a fantastic adventure, lot of adrenaline, lot of uh, motivation, and also a, a school, because uh, with all these problems and failures, um, the whole team, and myself included, learned incredibly from uh, this uh, very challenging mission. One critical uh, situation occurred uh, very shortly after launch. Um, we launched, the Spiska was inactive in the cargo bay, and then 12 hours later, the second shift on board the shuttle with our astronaut Claude Nicolier would wake up and start the activation of Eureka, which then would be released using the robotic arm of the shuttle, released into space, and then we would uh, then uh, take the control. So uh, very short after activation, we were already sending commands to the spacecraft via uh, the NASA communication system to the shuttle and via a little antenna that was sending, transmitting the radio commands uh, from the shuttle to our spacecraft, still in the cargo bay of the shuttle. As soon as we started this and the activation was increasing, uh, we started losing telemetry we were becoming completely blind. Basically, the shuttle could not decode anymore the telemetry that was coming from Eureka. And this was happening in a sort of random way. Occasionally it would disappear, after a while it would come back. It was a problem of 
locking on the signal coming from, uh, from Eureka. Um, with parallel failures, critical operations, time critical activities, we were really under a lot of pressure. Um, the way we solved it was, uh, uh, since we couldn't trust the communication between the shuttle and the, and the space cab in the cargo bay, we asked the astronauts to turn the shuttle and uh, to point the space cab to the ground. And then we used our ground stations, which were not foreseen to be used in that moment. They were foreseen to be used only after the uh, Eureka had become uh, uh, autonomous flying. Um, we used the ground station to communicate with Eureka. This was implemented in a rush. Uh, it led to a delay of the deployment by, by 12 hours, but eventually it worked. We defined a completely new timeline of activities only using the ground stations. In the, in the middle of uh, all the problems that we were having with Eureka, we had uh, a time bomb, which was basically, uh, we had to deploy the solar arrays within a few hours, otherwise the spacecraft would have been uh, dead because it would have had no more energy in the batteries. Uh, the flight rule said um, that uh, we had to deploy the solar arrays in the shadow in order to minimize the chances of, uh, of um, uh, damages, uh, to mechanical damages, because with the sun it could have been, uh, you know, thermal, um, thermal distortions. Um, having said that, with all the delays, with this end of the battery energy and the fact that we had to use the ground stations on ground, uh, we, uh, we could not guarantee that it would be deployed in the, in the shadow. So we had a fundamental conflict between the flight rules and uh, the, the knowledge at that time that if we hadn't violated the flight rule, uh, the mission would have been over. So at that point, uh, I was the space cab operations manager I had to tell, advise the flight director to violate the flight rule, which is not something that one should ever do. Flight rules have a good reason to be there. And there was a risk, of course, in this case, of a damage of the spacecraft. But at this stage, the, the decision was, do we take the risk of damaging the spacecraft by violating the flight rule, or do we terminate the mission? So I advised the flight director against, so against the flight rule, the flight director had to think uh, twice because it's uh, something that we try to avoid in all circumstances to violate the flight rule. But in that case, eventually he accepted uh, the advice. We took the risk and uh, we were lucky. Uh, eventually, the, um, the risk of a damage, of a mechanical damage was relatively small. And on the other side, we had the certainty of the end of mission. So we had to take this risk and violate the flight rule. So after deploying the solar arrays, we gained some time. We took time to define a new timeline using the ground stations, and then we activated the space curve using that. Um, these two problems uh, that we were experiencing were still there, but at least one, the communication with the shuttle, was not important anymore because we had found a backup communication uh, scenario. The other one, uh, we had gradually uh, managed to overcome when it was happening by switching off and switching on the units, the thermal control units. So we could reassure NASA that the astronauts were, were safe. Um, after the fact, uh, after the, the deployment and after Eureka was starting its mission, we discovered what the problem was. The problem was in a, the problem of the communication with the shuttle was caused by a, a an incompatibility between our telemetry system and the shuttle. Um, the shuttle system required uh, periodic transitions in the bits between zero and one in order to keep the bit lock, so the synchronization with the bits. And uh, Eureka did not guarantee this. There were phases, especially during the activation, where there were long strings of bits in the telemetry signal, which were without transitions, either long strings of zeros or long strings of ones. And um, once we understood this, uh, which could have been understood before by proper testing, uh, which was not done, but once we understood it in flight, we could define a deactivation sequence when, for the next shuttle to pick us up one year later that uh, uh, would minimize the periods of uh, 
incompatibility, so they minimized the times where we had these long strings of bits. And when they occurred, we had the, the uh, um, we at least we knew that they would occur, so we would not be caught by surprise. The uh, retrieval mission of Eureka with the second shuttle in 1993 uh, started with uh, a very important uh, activity that we had to perform. We had to uh, fold back the solar arrays and fold back, retract the antenna. Um, this was necessary in order for the shuttle to capture the spacecraft with a uh, remote manipulator, robotic arm, and then bring it back into the cargo bay. We did that, so we retracted the solar arrays and we latched them. This was also fundamental. That the, space the shuttle would not have brought us back to Earth if the solar arrays and the antenna, once retracted, were not latched. Solar arrays retracted and latched. Fantastic. This was the most complex mechanism we had. Then we retracted the antenna. And they retracted properly, but they were not latching. That means there was a hook at the end of the antenna arm that would have to block the antenna against the body of the spacecraft. And um, uh, the problem was that because of some uh, uh, movement of the multi-layer insulation on the spacecraft, once the arm retracted, the hook could not lock the arm against the body. Uh, this was a foreseen contingency. It was foreseen that the spacecraft would be kept overnight at the robotic arm, an astronaut would uh, go out and uh, in an EVA, it takes many hours to prepare for an EVA, and this was an unforeseen EVA, um, go out and then push the antenna against the body of the spacecraft, and at that time we would send a command to latch it. This was the procedure. Unfortunately, there was another problem that was discovered in that moment, uh, the robotic arm was not able to provide power to Eureka. And uh, this was necessary because Eureka had retracted the solar arrays at this point. So there was no way for Eureka to replenish the batteries. So what we decided to do was to change completely the approach. We deactivated Eureka, we had no energy anymore, brought it back into the cargo bay where a different connection, an umbilical connection, could provide power overnight and recharge the batteries. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, the spacecraft could be fully deactivated, powered just for the essential loads like the thermal uh, control, survive the night. The next day we would have had to completely reactivate it in order to be able for the astronaut to go out, push against the antenna, and we send the command to latch. So we spent the night um, designing the procedure, which was completely new, from scratch. Uh, it was a procedure that eventually was about 150 commands. It was the system engineer and myself. We were not on shift. The shift was now uh, of a different team. But we, we spent it in a separate room designing this procedure from scratch. Um, we did not have time to validate it, so we couldn't run it through the simulator. We only came up with the procedure just in time for the execution. So the next day, uh, the astronaut went out for the EVA. He was ready, was brought with the robotic arm to push gently the antenna against the body. He was ready to push. We were in parallel activating the spacecraft. We were towards the end of the procedure and we gave the instruction to the astronaut via Houston, of course, to push. In, after the astronaut started pushing, we had to send the latch command. But to do that, we had to send the, another command that was preventing some uh, protection mechanisms to, to react. When we sent that command, we lost completely the telemetry from uh, uh, the latching system, and we were surprised by that. So we were not ready to communicate with the astronaut that we were ready to latch. Uh, the astronaut was waiting, and in that moment there was uh, an interruption in the link, a foreseen interruption in the link between the shuttle and ground, is when the TDRS, the relay satellite system, hands over from one satellite to the next. So there were about six, seven minutes interruption. The astronaut was hanging there <laughs> against our antenna, waiting for our instruction. 
And um, when we recovered communications, in the moment we had realized what the problem was. Our previous command, the one that disabled the protection, had also disabled the telemetry. So we were ready to tell him, okay, push again, we latched and we resolved all the problems. Uh, but uh, this unexpected break in the activity of the astronaut, of course, caused a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions post-mission with NASA. Um, uh, they, were, they wanted to understand why. And the simple reason was that our procedure was perfect, was working very well, but there was this side effect that uh, uh, we could not anticipate, or we had not anticipated, the side effect of disabling telemetry. Had we been able to run it on the simulator, we would have known. At the end of the, of the mission, uh, our team went to debrief also with the astronauts of the space shuttle. And uh, the astronaut that was on the EVA, uh, David Lowe, um, told us that, actually thanked us for uh, this little hiccup in our procedure. He said that those were the best uh, seven minutes in his career, because normally EVAs are packed with activities. and You never had time really to realize and enjoy this incredible situation you are in. And so he was forced for seven minutes to sit there and wait so he could enjoy the the fantastic panorama, enjoying and uh, enjoying the uh, absolutely unique experience of an EVA without having for seven minutes anything to do. So he was very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you.